Uh, good evening. <laughs> it's good to be back. Yeah, thanks for that introduction, Ilya, and for, for your citizenship and kindness. I think that's OK still. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Nothing has gone wrong. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, so I can stay here. Um, and it's good, like I said, to be back here. Uh, I was here a few years ago when Tom Locks was here and he invited us. And I remember Good Evening Poetry and Fellowship Conversation. Uh, it was wonderful. We miss him. I'll read four poems. Two are elegies, although one is a post-elegy, I guess you could call it that. Um, recently, uh, maybe a week ago, we lost <clears throat> perhaps one of the great poets of the 20th century in the world, uh, Kamal Brathwaite. Um, so this is a poem for Kamal, which I wrote on his death. So, Kamal, dead. There's something deeply silent about snow covering things. And this morning, as if without warning, snow covered things. And around the Caribbean, people are studying the portents of the earth. An unexpected bird, a swift, a flapping banana tree, an apparition discovered in an ancient photograph like the one he discerned on the face of a slave ancestor in a photo he took accidentally at Cow Pastor, the one that prophesied he stayed put, plant there, fighting for the land. And they are all asking what cataclysm awaits us. And it's not a fancy to say that on days when the liars strut through these halls of power, when Trump's contagion of falsehood and unfeeling seeps through the darkness of dawn, slips over the soft, dusty snow, that this deeper silence of Kamau's passing is a prophecy, a portent of our time. It is how prophets mark epoch their births and their passing. I have stopped to look at the way these lines, these my lines move across the page and I think slowly, ever so slowly, and I think of Kamau at the podium, the patience of his voice holding us in suspension, waiting for the words to find their thorough fullness, their shape, before he speaks them. I think of how the fragmentation of his sentences scattered over the page are his way of saying, pause, saying, breathe, saying, trust poet that these things we say, each moment of syntax, each vowel, each breath fills the world with the roundness of meaning, of feeling. Trust the making silence before sound. Trust. How I have stood and rushed over language as if afraid of the truth of my words how he would fill the hall with the deep baritone of his silence, his breaths, his speaking, the poems taking shape before us, crackling with rhyme and song. And it is no wonder that Derek once mocked the language's patience occasion, all the time in the world of it, 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 how he mocked that which one cannot have, cannot believe in, cannot trust. Mock with an envy of soft love and desire, the trier mocking the natural. The one chosen to hum a deep music of our history into the long darkness. It is enough. It is enough, come on. 
I will not indulge in the binaries of poets gladiating against poets. After all, it's boring. It bored them and should bore us. And every side was a contradiction of sameness. They were two men wrestling with language and the fear of silence biding their time with the silences and sounds before the inevitable, this long silence before us now. Still, I say this here, a half joke, easily indulged. Both formers conjuring nicknames from the sky, easy teasing. In the end, the weight of Nagos overshadows the pettiness of a convenient joke. And even the clown knew this well. I've now come around to say that whatever, whenever I look at my first poems, all I see are the stumbling steps of one trying to find footing in Kamal's print. How imitable he was, how badly imitated he always was. Such bad poems spawned by his delicate craft, the deeper genius of his lyric architecture, the way it is sometimes so hard to hear the delicate art of a drum beat, and we all say beat, 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 imagining ourselves the makers of the drum, forgetting the slaughter of the goat, the blooding, the bone sticks left to blanch in the sun, the rituals of rum and light, the green stain of crushed leaves, the groaning of spirits, the rooster in the morning, the cowbell starting to lay the ground for the muses of history, the muse of memory, the muse of the deep sea song. Demirifa due, Demirifa, Demirifa due, oh, Demirifa. Oh, how we thought ourselves able to master the master, fools mistaking the kindness of music's doorway for its genius. Still, Without this sloppy imitating, where would I be? Where would I be today? Think then of the day in London in 1971, deep in winter, when it did snow, and Neville, my father, had arrived to be with us, and he walked with us through the city, and chuckling, he gave instructions for his African children on how to walk on fresh snow. How, he said, he, we should look for the footprints of others and place our feet in them, and we would not slip. And how, demonstrating this, he did slip, his two legs thrown upward to the sky, his arms flailing, a vision of the unraveling of a man of deep dignity and poise, something we had never seen before, the vulnerability of invol involuntary flight. Nor had we seen the athletic acrobatics of him writing himself, the magic of his ability to turn chaos to a kind of flight, his tan coat tails raising and then settling at the plant of his feet, his knees, and a squat before, chuckling even more with the bright astonishment of balance, he said, now step where I step. <laughs> and we did, despite the hint of skepticism for what we had seen. For we knew we could not turn chaos into dance, into flight, and settling into a music of a body remembering the genius of its making despite the years on him. Though now my poems have found their footing, and my understanding of the art of deep balance, the beauty of patience, the authority of love, Kamal is my marker, my art, my permission, my reggae aesthetic, my ethos, my beginning, and today I cannot even use lament. Instead, I say, I look before, hoping the snow will not cover completely the prince, though far ahead, his long silences, his long, deep silences into the hermitage of his last years, were a kind of lamentation, one he granted us, granted me. Why it is that every time I want to speak a poem, I long to find music, a song. What well, good, come on. What well, good, take time. What well, good. Come on, no words are enough. Nothing is enough. Nothing but these torn and constantly new words gathered here. Come out breath with.
So it's now three poems. I've reduced it to three now. So <laughs> as you can tell, these go on for a bit. Um, so this is a poem for my son. It's called Bright. Typically, I write occasional poems for my children. I have three kids. And then they got into this thing where they start to harass each other about who gets more poems written about them. You think, you think they were teenagers. They're grown ass people. And they say, um, so at some point, I decided to do a tally. And my son came out badly. So I decided I'll write a poem for him to make up for that. So this is a poem called Bright for Kelly, who is now killing his sisters about how great his poem is. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. It's always great to pretend that your children like your poetry, but it's, uh, it's all right. It's my delusion. I'll stick with it. Bright. It is only in the dispassion of a photograph recovered unexpectedly when the bodies must be identified. And the place and time calculated, only, when, only then do I see it is you and us, two men and a woman, grinning. And there is a bright cloud of joy in the space between us, a kind of laughing, which is another word for love. Your handsomeness is the reminder that I love a woman who may never know the uncertainty of a face. You inherited her beauty, that easy face that kind that makes us look again. In St. Louis, at the mattress barn, an old white woman, full of cheer for the season, is kind to us with laughter and suggestions, while your slow, easy limbs, the lope of your walk, fill the place. And then I recognize the strangeness in her body, the flirtation, the constant return, the effort to keep us around, keep you around. So that in the end, when she said, as if tortured into confession, you are a very handsome lad. <laughs> Apropos to nothing, and you nodded softly and mostly with a puzzled smile. I understood how the beautiful ones exist with their own skills of survival. Yes, you will suffer, my son, but oh, how warm some cold days might be as they are for the beautiful ones. There is a word for this reckoning, a, a word we, we learned 27 years ago, one May Day, the word son. You repeating the rituals of our bodies before you turned into our own splendid self. The space between us is the beauty you bring into this world. How we have said we never doubt your kindness to strangers, how you welcome people into your world with the ease of a heart full of the desire for simple fairness. And this kindness is what you teach us every day. You with your head full of music your mind replete with the imaginings of a maker. You who gaze into mysteries and smile, game to know and understand. To call you son is to name the blessings we have never truly earned. A kind of grace, a mercy, love. Bright light walking along the path. Bright light glowing through darkness. Bright. Bright. So his name means bright light on the path, which means that I named him prophet. I was a prophet. So I take, you know, again, once again, it reflects my genius um, <laughs> of seeing in this little piece of flesh the possibility of all this great stuff. So I take full credit for that. Thank you. Um, oh, I, you know, my wife had a little thing to do that. Uh, that. So I'll end with a poem uh, for my, my sister, who died uh, a year and a half ago. Um, and so this is a return. Uh, a few months ago, we went, I went back to Jamaica to, to the wedding of her son, my nephew. So, a year later, for Abba. Nearing Christmas now, 
The televangelists break into their sermons with the haunting of old seasons of childhood, flat-sounding German hymns of holy winter night. The air in the Roots Pentecostal Cathedral smells warmly of rum, the distillation of skin and sleep leaves a residue, a seductive cologne, and the men in their pastel bright jackets and white pants, eyes bloodshot with the night rituals, the women in their garments of fluent praise, proudly sheathing their round bodies, close their eyes, sink deep into the pleasure of thankfulness. And outside, I am driving through the Kingston, the Kingston, its slow Sunday ambulating, the traffic sluggish with indifference and the hills hazy in the morning, sun bright, we did not come for her, but in truth, we came to fill her absence. And on landing, I promised myself not to imagine her in the cliche of unuseful comfort. She's watching from above, etc. She is dead. We are none the better since, except we hug longer, harder, whispering in low gutturals. Love, yes, understand. I know, I know, it's dread. And then apart, our glistening eyes, not full enough for weeping, but sufficient to truncate our rehearsals of how we are doing. It is hard, we say, and no, no better, though it is better, just a little, for then the sunny city looked as dark as it has never been before, and it hurt in the body a throbbing wound. It was worse. So let's say we are here for kind of rituals, to rejoice in the bitter sweetness of life, it's disregard for loss, as if it is saying, if you continue in the house of mourning, know that the world will forge ahead, and bodies will commingle, and hearts will hunger for pleasure, and acceptance, and the orphan children, as if guided by some terrible primordial gluttony for the remaking of feeling, will hunger for love and seek in their gathering to make babies, the world, such a callous necessity marching on. It is the season for love, after the gray year of sorrow, or something worse, something unnameable, the year of great light, the unsmoking sluggishness of our hearts. Kingston, I have not announced my arrival to friends. Instead, I have slipped into your sepulcher of memory and felt in my heart an unspeakable disquiet, as if what I can lose no longer fills me with panic, but instead a dull resignation to the order of our coming and going. In the soft, stale light of her room, I look away from the body of my mother while she speaks into the darkness, repeating the memories of years before I even knew myself. And this, too, is a tender kind of love, one that has repeated itself so much that silence alone is its only language. She talks about her daughter, the one who left us bereft. I stare into the green mango tree, tree through the louvers where the light is delicate, a light she can't see. And it comes to me that for these three days of celebration, a small sermon turns in my head. Devara, O oh you who see every color that rushes towards you in this city, consume it all. Be greedy for the storing of light, for soon this too will pass into a kind of mute twilight before the shadows. I would have wanted a music to mark this interlude, a music I can return to again and again. But all I have is the quality of December sunlight in the tropics, ricocheting off glass and shiny waves, and sharpening the color drunk city with purifying light and softening shadow. This is the strange art I carry in me on my return to the endless stretch of prairie snow. Don't you see, dear friends, no matter where I go, my heart stays on that island with her, with her. Thank you very much.